This podcast was created by fans for fans and is not affiliated with or sponsored by Hallmark or the Hallmark Channel. Hello, I'm Eric. And I'm Andrea. And this is Hallmark Mysteries and More. All right, it's 2024 and we're kicking off the year with a brand new Hallmark Mystery, True Justice, Family Ties. And for something a little different, we have a producer on. We've never had a producer. We have Mike Barbudo. How are you doing, Mike? Hello. Uh, I'm doing well, Eric. How are you doing? I am doing absolutely fantastic. This is really exciting to talk to you because we have, being Hallmark fans, we have like all of our little notions of how things happen. But of course, mm -hmm. we have no idea really how they happen. I've talked to you know enough actors and some of the other people with a little behind the scenes. And so they've given me a little more glimpse into the business of Hallmark. Um, because as fans, we think, you know, why aren't you just doing what we love and this and the other and don't really understand the economics and the other things that are involved in a movie. And while we're not going to do too much time on that, because it may be a little boring, but obviously important, we are going to really try to talk more <laughs> about how a movie goes from like a notion to actually getting on screen. So, right, right. But first things first, like I said, we have our idea of what a producer is, but I've seen, I don't know if you saw it, I don't know if it was on Netflix or what, but The Offer, which showed the guy who's mm -hmm. the producer making The Godfather, and you know, he had to deal with mafia and union leaders and stuff like that. I'm guessing to make a Hallmark movie, you don't quite have to deal with, you know, the Italian mafia you know, <laughs> blowing up people. Not not as much. No, <laughs> you, you'd, you'd be surprised. Um... Uh, I've done oh gosh ten plus movies now for Hallmark and yeah no have not have not run into any organized crime syndicates or, or families as of yet so other other than in uh, on screen with your never uh, catch me if you claws but that's a whole nother story mm -hmm. all right so can you just tell us what actually a producer does and all of that yeah. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll focus specifically on like TV movies, like a Hallmark movie, let's say. So there's really two facets of the job. One is developing the idea, as you had mentioned, Eric, you know, how you have, what is that process, right? When you have the initial conception, um, which sometimes is as simple as a paragraph, you know, an idea, a conceit for a story. And then it's our job as the, the producer or the development executive to take that idea that seed and expand it into either like a one page pitch or something that gives an overview of what the world would be, what the characters would be, you know, what the story, the conflict is, what they're, they're coming back together, the resolution after what we call like an all is lost kind of moment and really kind of wrapping it up as succinctly as possible to give the network in this case, Hallmark, an idea of this is what we think the movie should be. Right. Um, and then if we're lucky enough to have them want to set that up, and put it into development then we as the producer find a writer we set a kickoff call with the network to kind of go through the ins and outs what they would like to see some of the things that they want to stay away from and then really from there you develop the story and you flesh out that one page pitch that we originally came up with into uh, a treatment or like a, a synopsis of what the movie would be that we call an outline it's usually about 10 pages then once the network signs off on that, you work with the writer to develop the script. Um, and then with any luck, you, the script is in good shape and we get it greenlit. And then it, so then your, your development stage, I guess you could say is done. Then you enter into the pre-production and principal photography production. And that's, to me, that's, that's where my love for this really my first love is that is being on set and you know being in the trenches and making the movie with the director the production designer talking about you know the the characters and that kind of thing with the actors because the interesting thing is you know we as the producer that take that initial concept and develop it all the way into the script which eventually gets shot I mean really that process is usually about I don't know four months five months sometimes six seven eight months right and by the time you're shooting it and you're sitting down with the actors and you're sitting down with the director, it's really the first time you're hearing what their thoughts are on it. So it really becomes a collaborative effort. You know, like I like to say that it's like um, like a relay race where the baton goes from me and the writer 
to the director and the actors, and then it eventually goes on to the editor. And then you're in the post-production phase. So then we, as the producer, oversee post-production and make sure that the movie is cut to the the specifications and like the, the preferences that the network has until we ultimately deliver the movie to a network like Hallmark, and then they air it. And then that's pretty much in a nutshell, kind of, you know, all the stops that the movie. Okay, so that's that's really interesting because for me, I always assumed it would be like essentially writers sending you scripts, which I guess it's, maybe is it both ways where sometimes you yeah. just get scripts and then other times it's like you're just out at dinner. And you're like, whoa, this would be a great idea for a movie. And then oh. you go find like, I guess it goes both ways, huh? It does. It does. And to the latter, it actually drives my wife nuts because we will be out to dinner or we will be out doing something and I'll stop and kind of look at something and she'll be like, you're getting an idea, aren't you? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah I just got to write it down. Hold on one second. You know, then you come up with a concept that's kind of a cool thing. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it's, you know, you share it, and you put it out there and everyone goes, that's a horrible idea. You know, <laughs> But yeah, a lot of the times we do get... Um, either those pitches, like I mentioned, um, from writers who, you know, sometimes it's new writers, sometimes it's writers that we work with all the time um, that say, what do you think of this? You know, because it's our job as the development executive to know, to have our ear to the ground and know what the market is asking for, you know? So then we'll say, yeah, yeah it's a cool idea. Or, you know, Hallmark already made one like that last year. So they might not be looking for something like that. Or the mandate is now this, and this is kind of feels like, you know, what would have been popular a couple of years ago. Um, so sometimes it's that. Uh, other times the writers come to us with a finished script. You know, in the case of the strike, you know, a lot of writers took that as an opportunity because they legally weren't allowed to work, you know, to polish old projects that they had or just do freelance writing, write, write pilots, write, you know, feature length scripts on spec and that kind of thing. And then once the strike was over and they were allowed to share and we were allowed to, you know, resume the conversations with them, we were flooded with all these new, wonderful scripts where it's like okay let's just take this in and see if we can sell this because this is fully formed and you know so sometimes that's a benefit sometimes it's you know it's it depends um but yeah really the development process to to answer to make a a long answer longer it's really all, all options are on the table you know what i mean like we we see pretty much every scenario you can imagine okay now that's uh that's pretty cool. now i have to start doing my little scheming of how I can come up with an idea that I can pitch you and get, yeah, we, get it we on actually, the, in the big screen. We, we once sold a movie, uh, my boss, uh, Joel Rice, who's the executive producer at True Justice, and you know he's been my career mentor for a long, long time. He once sold an idea of mine based on the title. That was it. They just loved the title. What, you know? what was so, the title? I knew you were going to ask. Uh, it was called Affair to Remember. So it was about a um, yeah uh, an Uber driver who fell in love with the owner uh, of an NBA basketball team. And he thought she was somebody else and she couldn't come clean with it, even though she kept trying. Um, the universe kept blocking her from admitting who she actually was. But yeah, it was kind of a, a takeoff from obviously an, an affair to remember. Right. You know what I mean? So just based gotcha. on the title, I thought that was clever enough to put into development. So that was kind of cool. All right. So we, we talked a little bit before we uh, started recording that your, your beginning of, of your career was in acting, but then you, mm -hmm. since well, you do a little bit of acting still, but mostly you're really enjoying getting in, into producing. So what was it that said, you know what, I don't want to be in front of the camera as much. I want to be, you know, going ahead and developing these ideas and stuff. Um, it's a very good question. Um. I think I, well, first of all, I always had. Well, are you a control freak? Yeah, I am. That's what I was trying to find a, <laughs> a <laughs> say, way of wording that, but yeah, total, total control freak. Um, yeah, man, I, I think honestly, like even when I was acting, when I was lucky enough to book a job and act, I was constantly always like looking beyond the camera into like video village or looking at the production design or, you know, trying to. Now at the time, I knew nothing about producing. You know, it's it's funny, like looking back now, having done this for a number of years, when I think about what I thought I knew back then as just an actor when it came to producing compared to now, it's almost laughable how I knew absolutely nothing. But yeah, I, I just it was always something that I was interested in. I always wrote, you know, um, I was always writing different projects and, you know, trying to sell them. If I book a job, the the producer that I mentioned, Joel, he hired me as an actor probably eight or nine times. 
And I think probably every time I was trying to pitch him an idea I had, you know, like either for a Hallmark movie or, you know, a spec pilot or this kind of thing. So then eventually he came to me, I guess this was probably 20, 2018, 2019, and said, you know, you kind of have an eye for this. Is this something you would ever want to do full time, you know, production and development? And I said, no, I'm an actor. You know, it's, it's I have no desire to do that full time. I enjoy it. But at the same time, you know, I, 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 I want to be an actor. And then, you know, you eventually look in the mirror and, you know, you mentioned the offer. You know, I, I realized I'm not Miles Teller just yet, <laughs> you know, like the actor. So maybe it's not a bad idea to give this producer, you know, uh, I guess, gig a fair shake. So I made the transition. I mean, I still act, as you said, once in a while, but I made the transition officially probably in 2019 and uh, have been doing oh, it just, ever just since. Just in time and for COVID, huh? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Actually, the first movie I ever produced, I I'd produced other stuff outside of Hallmark, but the first Hallmark movie I produced, the first two were uh, during COVID. So I never really knew anything different. So everyone, you know, used to ask me, is that trickier? You know, like there's a lot of health and safety protocols. There's a lot of measures that you have to put into place. But because that role was new to me, as far as producing, I had been on set for you know, thousands of hours as an actor, but because that role as a producer was new to me, I didn't really know anything different, you know, so it didn't come across as more challenging, let's say, than, you know, a non-COVID set, because it just, that was the norm, you know. So you, you kind of remind me a little bit of a story that I, uh, I grew up playing lacrosse and whatever, I did it. And then um, out here, in, I'm in Arizona, of uh, uh, boy, about... 20 some years ago, lacrosse started coming, becoming a thing. I'm like, I'm going to coach. And I'm like, I know how, I know everything about lacrosse. And I, I like, you know, when you're talking about being an actor, you sit there and you, you have your world that you know. But then when I became a coach, I realized like I had so many responsibilities yeah. that it was yeah. just like, I'm like, wow. And like, it just blew me away by how many different things I had to do and how little I actually knew about lacrosse because I had to learn, you know, what other positions did, what, how to react to all the different things. So I kind of likened it now, obviously that was coaching little junior, junior high lacrosse, which uh, what you're doing is far the, bigger complex, but maybe the same size egos. No, but it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think, the, I think the metaphor still is, is, is a good one. You know what I mean? And I, I hate to say, I try very carefully, like the way in which I word this, because like I said, I am an actor. I have all the respect in the world for, for actors. I think it is an, an immensely difficult thing to do what they do and to do it well. And ultimately we have nothing if we don't have our performers in front of the camera. Um, so, but, but I will say like, it's, this is why I say like, it's, you gotta be careful the way you word it. When I was acting, it, it, it did, a myopic kind of view like a one-dimensional thing and then once all of a sudden you start producing it's like the world does this and it's like oh wow so when i was on set just doing my thing there's a whole host of problems happening all around me you know that right. a good producer is dealing with and troubleshooting and putting out a million different fires and that kind of thing and i never knew that that was occurring and that usually meant that the producer was doing a good job you know what i mean so now that that's my role it's just, it's interesting, you know, to, to be in, I guess, the, the flip side to it sort of thing. But I'll tell you, man, there are days when, you know, you are in your temples putting out a bunch of different fires where I think, oh, Christ, I wish I was just acting. In this. <laughs> <laughs> I know, one, one job, one job. So, yeah, yeah. But, but again, an insanely um, difficult job, you know, that right. it doesn't work unless they do it well. So that's, that's kind of the gig, right? Totally, totally agree. All right. So as a producer, like what, what do you look for? What qualities are you looking for in projects that you're going to go ahead and, you know, try to pitch and all that? Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's Hallmark or whether it's outside the scope of Hallmark, um, any, any scripted content, I'm very much, now this is almost a cop out answer. I'm very much drawn to something that I've never seen before. Anything that's it's like, you know, okay, let, let's take Hallmark for a second because with Hallmark, their brand recognition is the best in the world. You know, as a network, they are so successful with their brand. You know, you you say I'm a Yellowstone fan, you don't say I'm a Paramount Plus fan. You know, but nobody says I'm a specific movie of Hallmark fan. You always say I'm a Hallmark fan. So the network is almost ahead of the title, the the product that they produce. You know, so because yeah. of that, they have a very specific brand, and they're very very good at marketing it. Right. So 
And I don't think it's I, what I find super creatively challenging and, uh, and fulfilling is because of that, you're not really supposed to reinvent the wheel. You're not allowed to reinvent the wheel, but we can give it a rim that nobody's ever seen before. You know, so to answer your question, when you say like what excites me or what what what, what makes my eyebrow kind of raise when I get a new pitch or I read a script or something, it's when it's in that vein, when it's towed the line, kind of like a catch me if you clause, where exactly, it's towed the line thinking. of I, I know it's the Hallmark movie, but this is something nobody's ever done before. You know what I mean? And that's kind of cool to me because it's not a big city lawyer going to a small town anymore. The network has changed. That's not, it's telling stories that are more reflective of who we are as a people, as a society in 2023. And I think that that's so monumentally important. It can still be escapism. It can still be aspirational. It can still be feel good, like comfort food, you know? Nobody tunes into Romeo and Juliet to see if they end up with somebody else. You know what I mean? Like you, you want that love story. You want to see your leads come together. But at the same time, if we can tell a story and how they come together differently than the way anybody else has done it before, then that to me is what gets me super excited. And what amazes me too, man, is that you think, okay, Hallmark's made so many movies, you know, like at some point you, it's got to be a finite amount of ideas. Like, will you run out? And it's, it always impresses me, the talent with these writers, they come up with something and they'll send it to me and I'll be like, oh man, I'm kind of jealous that I didn't think of that, you know, because it's just, it's, it's different. It's new. It's, yeah, it's cool. Well, I'll say that, uh, ironically, I just today over in my Hallmark, uh, movie reviewer, which focuses on the rom-coms, I just posted most innovative, uh, awards today and right before hmm. we got on our call. And that's what I said this year, Hallmark was there's you know there's that whole joke about oh they have one plot for you know five actors one plot kind of thing yeah and this year they completely shattered it and once your you know catch me a few claws was a great example of that but um some of the movies the um uh christmas on on cherry lane i don't know if you saw that one with the three timelines mm -hmm. going yeah like the, oh, I've seen Walmart them just delivered <laughs> completely different movie. You know, you still had some of your comfort food in there, which we all want, but just the whole level of just different and yeah. innovative movies this year was just off the charts and it was fantastic. And like you said, it still though delivered all those components that you want, you know, at the end you feel good and all that. So yeah, I, I hear you. Um, and it is interesting, especially like you say, if you live in that world of Hallmark to be able to get those fresh ideas because you know, when you have the big city girl come into the small town thing of how to make that fresh, that, that can be a challenge. And obviously you brought in a Santa Claus, which uh, a Santa Claus, apprent uh, I guess he's not an apprentice. Uh, what, what was he taking over the family business Santa Claus? So that was pretty interesting. Yeah, the the heir apparent yeah. played so exceptionally well by Luke, Luke McFarland too. He's just, I can't say enough good things about that guy. He's a genuinely wonderful human being, you know, good good man good father phenomenal actor you know he's got so much range and honestly like we we had an excellent director on that one too so that helps a lot as far as giving time to the actors to play and Italia Ricci as well as as Luke they're just they're so smart with script analysis we would talk before every scene about okay how can we heighten this how can we elevate this what can we do to bring more to it you know and his performance, I mean, we had so many different takes that were undulated where he would go a little bit bigger and broader and over the top. And then one that was kind of down the middle and right in the pocket. And then one that was a little bit more subdued. So when you have that level of freedom in the edit to kind of play with performance, you know what I mean? And go a little bigger here and a little smaller there. I think that really aids in what you were saying as far as, you know, being able to push the envelope and go a little bit further. You know, like one of the things that made that movie so special is how different the performances were compared to your traditional christmas movie totally know. totally all right so speaking we were talking about you know a little hallmark and you you have some experience out there how's hallmark like working with hallmark different than working with other companies mm -hmm. that you're pitching your ideas to um well i think like i said because they they are so specific with their brand you know what i mean i mean nobody knows what their audience wants more than the network you know what i mean um so the level of involvement right from the get-go now, granted, I don't want to get too much into like the insider baseball because like you said, I think right. the majority of you know the listenership might find this kind of boring, but there's there's different tiers, right? So if you have a what we call a licensed movie, you know, it's very different than the network's involvement versus if I made what we call an acquisition, which is right. you know, as the independent studio or the independent 
producer. I, you know, they sign off on an idea. I make it, I pay for it entirely. And the network involvement is much less. And then I deliver a finished product to them that they acquire, you know, and that's an acquisition. Whereas a licensed movie is they grant us a license to make it for them kind of thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just leave it at that. But the point is, is the network involvement is, is pretty strong, you know, right from the get go, which I actually appreciate because the, the relationship that we have uh, the company that I work for, the relationship that we have with the executives over at Hallmark is phenomenal. And they're wonderful people. And they're very, very smart insofar as, like I said, knowing, having their thumb on the pulse of what their audience wants. You know, this year, in specifically, like take the Christmas movies. They knew from last year doing movies like Haul Out the Holly, the first one, right? Or Three Wise Men and a Baby, that as long as there's still a central romance that's like the driver, but we play a little bit with more of an ensemble cast. The comedy's a little bit broader. The stories are a little bit more outside the box. You know what I mean? Like it's, those tended to do well. So then this year they said, okay, let's push the envelope and let's do more of that, you know? And I think, I honestly think this year's Christmas lineup for the countdown to Christmas was the best it's ever been, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's enjoyable. I find it, I find it pretty gratifying working for a network like that, that A, not only knows their brand so well, but B has a good synergistic relationship with us, both creatively and on the business front. All right. So one of the things that Hallmark has been hanging their hat on that mostly I think around 2020, they obviously had a very big change of leadership over there, but it's the importance of diversity and representation, right? And you you mentioned a little earlier, the, you know, being the world of where we're, we're at now in 2023, 2024, when this actually airs. But like how, as a producer, how does that affect some mm -hmm. of your decision makings or is it sort of more down the road when it really comes into play? Honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't affect us in a, a negative way at all, as far as like, Oh, you know, we, we now have less business or, you know, it's, it dovetails very nicely with the mission statement that we as a company have. So I work for a company called Muse Entertainment and our very missions, like our, 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 our brand is, to tell stories for those that historically were never granted the the gift of being the the lead in their own project, you know, or the, the lead in their own movie or TV series kind of thing. Like we we don't shy away from telling stories that are real, you know. But at the end of the day, we also want to make sure that they're inclusive, that it's you know reflective, like I said, of of what society looks like today, you know, as opposed to creating this this artificiality, you know. And I mean, it just and honestly. The celebration of diversity, I think, is is such a cool thing in the holiday space. I mean, I, uh, our company, we did the first Kwanzaa Christmas movie a couple of years ago called Holiday Heritage. Oh, yeah. uh, the year before that, we did the first Korean Christmas movie. You know, I produced one called um, with Raymond Ablak and uh, Catherine uh, Henna Kim um, that was called Boyfriends of Christmas Past. That was the first okay. Korean Christmas movie. You know what I mean? Like this past year on the non-Christmas side we did one um, that was an original that uh, myself and a friend came up with a writer friend of mine called never too late to celebrate with Carlos and Alexa Panavega, you know, right. that was it, honestly, I'm more proud of that one than, you know, like that one's right up there for me. That was, and I mean, that one was all about uh, a Latina woman turning 30 who was having a quinceanera because she never had one when she was 15. So just to explore that world, you know what I mean? Right. To me, when you get to do projects like that, so when I have a company that is super supportive of, you know, myself and our team exploring making movies like that, um, as well as a network that's open to it, where it's not, you know, what what was the reality for other places, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. It's, like I said, it's insanely gratifying because it, it's it's right in line with what we want to do and that's what they want to do. So when you have that creative kind of synergy, it just makes life easier and it makes it fun to go to work you know now do you get like a script or a story and you're working and you're like oh why don't we just transform these characters maybe from you know what they are into maybe being like a gay couple or you know trained mm -hmm. into an ethnic thing and sort of manipulate it down the road so to speak or is it usually written I that think way i personally uh I, there are people that do do that I don't like to do that because to me, I always say that no one person is any one thing. So to do the plug and play thing where it's like, oh, this was a, 
a cis white couple, you know what I mean? And like, this is a hetero story, but we're going to now make them, you know, this, or we're going to make them that. I, I, to me, that story needs to be told with so much more genuine uh, detail than just saying, well, here, take out the white guys and put in this, whatever, you know, X, you know, yeah. I it just, it doesn't really work. So whenever we do, and we have stories like that in development with network and other, with uh, Hallmark and other, other networks, other buyers. Um, but to me, I look as it, I tend to want to find stories like that, that are from writers that are, you know, um, representative of whatever that, that culture or that cohort is, you know what I mean? If we're telling an LGBTQ story, I don't want to come up with that on my own. I want to find a writer who has a great story that where he or she is LGBTQ, but at the same time, you know, it's not a coming out story. It's not a story about being gay. It's just a regular story where it just so happens that the leads are like that because we don't need to comment on that anymore. You know, same with if it's a different culture, you know, I don't want to tell a, uh, a lunar new year story and have a chinese you know setting if i'm the one coming up with that or i'm working with a white writer i want to find a chinese writer who knows the nuance of that culture because that's when that's when those things sparkle man that's that's when you get people being like oh my god that's so cool i had no idea that that's what they did because you have that that genuine you know touch from somebody who's lived it who's breathed it who's experienced it you know so so it's actually interesting you made me think of the whole pr sort of progression of their diversity because, and the reason why I asked, if you go back a few years, it did seem like that's all they did was like, okay, we had the secondary character. We're going to make their relationship. The best friend. Yeah. They're, they're going to all of a we're going to convert them. Yeah. You know, they're going to be this. Whereas now you do see it's definitely more just part of the story. And we're going to yeah. get in talking to her um, a little bit in a second, but with Catherine, you know, she was groundbreaking because when she starred in um, Love Classified and they had that first female, female kiss, it was like, oh my God, the, you know, the world exploded. And I had some of the, um, the thing I was trying to tell everyone was that was just a love story, right? It just happened to be yeah. two, two yes. women who, who happened, you know, came together. And, but it was just, it was mostly like about family and their love. And, but it was like so much hubbub. And then now you fast forward and you just had the final movie of this countdown to Christmas was um, Friends and Family Christmas, which featured yeah. a lesbian relationship. And it was so funny. It was like almost a complete non-factor. And so you just see the progression. That's about a year and a half of how, it, you know, yeah. you had the holiday sitter last year with Jonathan Bennett, which was, you know, so groundbreaking because it featured the first gay couple. But, you know, to, to be able to evolve to where, like you say, it's just sort of, natural and it doesn't call attention to itself i, th I think it's been mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest things but it is like we said a second ago it used to be yeah just pluck out that person and make the best friend or the you know the the the, the uh event planner or something like that some side yeah. character that you could just get the yeah. token diversity in and now it's very core to to the stories so right yeah it's something we're very cognizant of for sure and i think it's Look, it's 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 slow moving, but we're going in the right direction. Right, right. That's because I also oh, get some of the people who are wanting it to be like, oh, they're not diverse enough. I'm like, it, just go back a couple of years and you'll see. Like you said, it's it's yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the big ship turning, right? They don't just yeah. make a right turn. So all right, so we we you know we talked about the uh, catch me if you clause, and we're about to talk about true justice. So that's a little bit. You've got that rom com, then you're also a mystery. Do you have like a preference mm -hmm. of the kind of story that I know you said you like a unique one, but is there like sort of that more drama one, the grillier or the fluffy rom-com? Do you have like this, the natural favorite? Uh, God, these are good questions, Eric. You know what? I love, I love certain elements about all of them. Um, I will say that if I had to pick one, like gun to head kind of thing, you know, you can only do this kind of movie for the rest of your career it would definitely be the mysteries. I, I do enjoy those. I think the opportunity to turn these movie wheels into a franchise and, you know, hopefully, you know, God willing, we, we're lucky enough to see True Justice go on and, and, you know, have many, many installments. That to me is the greatest fulfillment. I think the biggest differentiation between a mystery, let's say, and a rom-com, is in a rom-com, right? If I've got my two leads, 
and there's I've got three scenes in a row of watching them fall in love, you know, between like acts three and six, let's say. Chances are when I'm in the edit, because you gotta remember these movies are 84 minutes long. You know what I mean? They're not they're not two hour features, they're they're TV movies. So they gotta be 84 minutes. So if I'm watching scene after scene after scene in a rom com that's character driven, not necessarily story driven, right? Of two people falling in love. In the edit, I could probably be like, oh, I don't need that scene. I've got them walking in the park, and then they, they're buying ice cream together. Then they have their almost kiss. I don't need the ice cream scene. I can just go from one to the other. You know, like I'm, it sounds like I'm oversimplifying it, um, and I don't mean to make it sound trivial or whatever, but oftentimes that is the, the, the approach with the rom-coms. With a mystery, though, it's vastly different in the sense that those are story-driven. So if I all of a sudden have to cut that movie down and pluck out a scene, well, now I might have just lost a crucial piece of information, you know, that I need in a later scene to tell that story. Otherwise, it becomes confusing. And I think all too often, look, you shoot these, you prep these things in three weeks, you shoot them in three weeks, you edit them in a couple of weeks. You know, I've seen many from other networks where they do kind of fall flat on their face and they do get confusing, you know, and it's because... Nobody really did the work properly in the beginning with the script when you're developing it or in pre-production. You know, that's something that we're very careful of. So because that process requires such a, a, a careful um, overview, right, when you're going through the development process in the script and being like, okay, if we, if we keep this scene, we know we're going to be long, so we got to condense it and only keep the pertinent information, you know, and then that carries over into pre-production, that carries over into principal photography, as well as in post-production when you're editing. So because that process is a little bit more, you have to be hyper aware, I, I find it more of an adrenaline rush. Like I low-key like it better. And I also love, you know, just the excitement of like telling a murder mystery, you know what I mean? They can be cozy, but they can also be kind of edgy and different. And that's another thing too, talking about staying on brand, but figuring out a way to give it a rim that nobody's seen. Well, now, you know, on HMM, those mysteries, they want things that are a little bit younger and hipper and skew a little bit, you know, younger for the audience and that kind of thing. So to create something that's not as cozy, which don't get me wrong, I love them, you know, like we stand on the shoulders of all the successful franchises. Uh, but to, to be able to create something that's like, um, I don't know, a Law and Order meets 21 Jump Street, you know, that's that's right. fun. That's cool, you know. All right. So we, we, you mentioned her a little before with Italia Ricci, and I, I just want to say it's not a question, but she needs sure. to be in a mystery because Catch Me If You Claws was kind of a mystery. You know, it was a fun capery thing, but yeah. it's kind of a mystery. But I was watching that thinking she totally could be over in Hallmark Mysteries um, and, and just well, I'll tell, I'll, so tell you this, I'll tell you this about Italia. Yeah, she is. She is. There's nothing that she can't do. I would work with her for the rest of my life if I was lucky enough to. Um, you know, if there was ever an opportunity to put her in a mystery, I'm I'm game. You know, I would do anything with her. I would literally produce a circus show with her if it meant she was the <laughs> the, the ringmaster. You know what I mean? Like she's yeah. she's that good. All right, we're going to move into now the speed round of uh, some questions. So the first one I ask, I ask everyone, and it's really pretty much a uh, personality. It is it is it's you know your character. It's a character question. But what's your opinion of pineapple on pizza? Uh, I am Canadian. Originally, I'm from Toronto. So you'd be surprised how many people do the Hawaiian pizza thing out there. I don't mind it. My wife loves it. I'm Italian, too. So a lot of people would say that that's sacrilege. But behind closed doors, I dig it. In public, I'll, I'll never admit to liking it. All right. Well, I, th I think you're a closet psycho then. So I actually, I grew up, I grew up in Windsor. <laughs> Um, so oh, okay. uh, I got my Canadian roots in me and I still worst thing ever. All right. But <laughs> Mad Madison Smith is a Canadian and he's the one who started this whole question by saying it's his favorite food. And I was just flabbergasted. So, all right. You just mentioned you're from Toronto. So are you a hockey fan? Uh, not anymore. I've been out here in LA for over 20 years now. So I lost touch with the Maple Leafs. Which, right. why anybody would not want to be disappointed year in and year out, I, I don't know. But <laughs> that, Well, that was my question was, what's more frustrating, a movie that flops or the Maple Leafs annual flop in the playoffs? H hands down the Leafs. Hands down. I have to listen to my family say, this is the year. Every year, this is the year. And every year, and it was only two years ago where I said to my wife, you know, like, I'm going to stop jumping on this bandwagon once the playoffs start because, you know, 
It's yeah. just, it's the definition of insanity. You know, the same it thing is. over and over, expecting a different result. It's crazy. It is, it is. Fortunately, I'm a Red Wing fan, so I've, I've enjoyed the okay. happiness. Not lately, but, um, but there, so. Okay, so you've got to, we, we mentioned it before, you're an actor um, originally, mm -hmm. but then you've evolved into a producer. So I'm going to do a two-part question, but so as okay. a producer, what movie classic would you love to do a remake of? Ooh, that is a very good question. Um, what movie classic would I like to do? Okay, so if we're talking Hallmark, I've always, always, always wanted to do a remake of uh, The Count of Monte Cristo. I think the idea, if you could somehow transform that, and I've tried a couple times and haven't been successful yet, but the idea of transforming like a long con or like a long revenge or something, you know what I mean? Like I, to me, I feel like there's, there's a play in there where we could do it right for Hallmark, especially now how they, they are, you know, branching out and doing different things, but that would be the one for Hallmark. And then as far as a non Hallmark uh, uh, remake, I'm, I'm a big horse guy, you know, when I'm not on set and I'm not working and doing this, I'm with a horse. Uh, my boys and I, my two sons, we, we ride a couple times a week. So any Western, I've still never done a Western, um, you know, Tombstone or Young Guns is a good franchise. Young Guns. I would love to do a, awesome. a oh yeah, Emilio Estevez, <laughs> All right. Lou Diamond Phillips, the, the know, whole like, game. So, or maybe a, oh yeah, like a reimagining of that, an ensemble Western, I think would be pretty awesome. cool. All right. Well, then as an actor, what role like in a, in a classic movie would you love to be cast as in a remake of? Hmm. I think I, I gravitate toward comedy. You know, that th those were always my I was always stronger with comedy. I think the idea of the challenge of of reimagining a classic character that is so iconic, but you you take the challenge which i think takes a lot of guts and then say, yeah. you come you come out the other end being like oh my god now i'm not comparing myself to like a bill murray but if they redid caddyshack you know to do like a, a carl spackler you know like that kind of thing because how could you make it totally different you know i find that that appealing you know or like um like a rick moranis like playing lewis in ghostbusters you know like to, to redo that kind of thing i think the, that would be the scariest, but probably the most gratifying to take on a challenge like that. That would be bold. That would be bold. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'm not putting myself in the same league as those actors, but like there's the the crazy masochistic, you know, like I said, like that low key love for the adrenaline rush, I think would be like, yeah, sure. Let's, let's try that. All right. All right. So what's the, uh, either as an actor or as a producer, but what's the coolest thing you've ever kept from a set? I know you've had a, you've had, uh, a actually, you've had a snake something. Yeah, well, it's 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 not even a secret really anymore. I think I've done, I want to say 10, 10, I've produced ten different Hallmark movies with the same crew in Ottawa, where we predominantly shoot um, the ones that I oversee. And the one thing that I took on, like movie two or three, was a a little Hawaiian, um, like one of those things that sits on the dashboard oh, the of like, girl? your car. Yeah, yeah, the hula girl that kind of like it's like one of those like bobblehead, right. but the whole body moves. I put that in every single movie. You, you might notice it actually. That, sitting wait, was that in the car? That was in the, the car. Kiss. Yep. The kiss, right? That's okay. Good eye. So that's in, and it's also in um, in True Justice. It's in um, uh, Alex Nunez's um, a van in Liam's van, the the PI. Okay. So well, yeah, it makes it makes a subtle appearance. So yeah, the, the little hula dancer is probably my uh, the one thing. I think that's probably the only thing I've ever taken. So, so you you it. took it from a set and you keep returning it to sets. Yeah, I asked the prop master, who's a friend of mine. On like I said, like it was the second or third movie I made in Ottawa with this team. I was like, I love this. Can I keep this after we're done wrapping? And she said, Sure. And then I was looking at it and I was like, I'm gonna put it in my next one. So then I did, and then I just gave it back to her. Now she holds on to it. And if we end up using a different props team, that property master inherits this little Hawaiian hula dancer. And it's like, what is this again? And then somebody has to explain to them, ah, it says it's Mike, the producer. He always puts this stupid hula girl in. So is it thought out ahead of time where you're going to, where you're going to stick it? Or you just sort of like, Hey, wait a minute. It'll fit here. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish there was the answer that I want to give you is, Oh yeah, it's, it's pre thought out. We know exactly where it's going to go. Typically Eric, I'm so busy 
And these things are so fast and furious that on like day 13, I'm like, oh, shit, the hula girl. I, I got to put that in there somewhere. <laughs> so then we run to the, the warehouse and somebody grabs it and brings it to set. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's figure out where we can put it in. And, you know, well, you, you, you stuck her in the steamiest scene in Hallmark history this time. So, yeah, actually, I think that was Italia whose idea it was to put, put it in that scene. All right. Put it on the dash of the, uh, the car. All right. Well, let's get down to what we're uh, here to talk about, and that's True Justice Family Ties. Mm -hmm. So take us through the process of how this one was made. Um, like I saw, which was kind of interesting, that um, Nikki and Megan, they wrote it, which I'm surprised they that did. she's not the producer because she kind of produces everything, it seems like, on Hallmark these days. But like, how did like this one come around? So it's an interesting... Interesting story, actually. The execs um, who we love working with, who we've done multiple movies with, they wanted, again, a, a mystery franchise that was an ensemble that skewed a little bit younger um, as far as audience and, you know, just had a different kind of vibe to it. Um, so in kicking around some ideas with our, our L.A. team, uh, we came up with the concept, uh, which originally was called Exonerate, that was about these law school students that start this unofficial group. Um, where they rely on each of their individual skills as an intern, be it, you know, forensics or, you know, evidence law or that kind of thing to help exonerate people that are wrongfully accused and sitting behind bars for crimes they didn't commit. Um, so we beat it out the entire treatment for that first movie and shared the co what we call like a concept doc kind of thing that was sort of like an unofficial outline or like full synopsis of the movie. Um, we gave it to Nikki and Megan, who are phenomenal writers. I mean, they're they're incredible. Wait, Nikki. But how would you like pick them out? Like, that's just uh, well, well like, because at the time, so we have another franchise, uh, Family History Mysteries. Okay, with, right, um, right. You probably know Niall yeah. Mater, Janelle Parrish. That's that's ours as well that we did with the same, um, the well, a di different executive, but for Hallmark. And Nikki is one of the producers of that show. Now we have a lot of things in development with Nikki and Nikki and Megan as writers, Nikki as a producer, you know, obviously she's entrenched in, in the Hallmark right. universe. You know, she, there's nothing that woman can't do. She's absolutely incredible. Um, so again, my, my boss, Joel, who is the visionary and, you know, he's a very propulsive dude. He's the one that makes everything happen behind the, um, behind the curtain. And uh, he said, this would be great for Nick, for Nikki. Her husband's a lawyer. He's an entertainment lawyer. And, you know, okay. I think she would resonate with this. And let's give it to Nikki and Megan and see if they want to write it. So we gave it to them. And I was in Ottawa filming another movie at the time. And we took a call with them. And they were like over the moon. They read it. And they were like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much for thinking of us. This is incredible. Like, we totally want to write this. And right from the get-go, they had so many ideas about – because, you know, we – we as the development executives aren't professional writers, right? So we can only take the concept so far, but when you give it and you put it in the hands of, you know, real talented writers like that, they just elevate the material so much in the way that they deepen the relationships, the way that they, you know, expand the world and make everything just a little bit more nuanced. You know what I mean? It just, it, 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 it started to sink. It just came to life. And the process of getting the script written from that initial concept doc that we gave them was actually not I'm trying to remember now because this would have been almost a year ago um it wasn't nearly as challenging as other projects you know because there was such a clear thought out idea of what this thing should be and everybody was kind of on the same page creatively um and that carried right over into into pre-production as far as casting you know we just it, it all just came together very seamlessly which is great all right. So speaking of the casting, so how did, well, obviously we know how Nikki cast Nikki, but um, like, how did, how did the rest of the cast come together? How do you, how do you decide who to pick for, for, for all these? Cause there's so much talent out there. There is, there is a lot of times. I mean, like it comes down to, there's a couple different, I mean, sometimes the network says, this is who your, your, what we call one and two, your two leads are. Um, other times, you know, we'll have a conversation with the executive in charge of the, the project as well as uh the woman who's the head of casting and her casting team over at hallmark and we'll say who are you excited about and they'll say well we would love it if you could you know approach this person this person this person and see if they're available um and other times they're like i don't know who do you think and then we come up with a list of people that we like you know in this particular situation cat cat was always i think everybody's top choice 
there was probably three different actors. So, so wait, we when, when you say the top choice, is that like it was written? Like, did Nikki think of her when she was writing it, or was it after it was uh, written? No, after it was written, it was like, was... oh, that really fits her. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, it was after it was after it was written, um, and then I think once once Catherine's name came up, we were like, oh, oh yeah. I mean that makes perfect sense, you know. Um, so we reached out to her, and I think, yeah, we were all simultaneously hoping that we would be able to make it work with her. And when we found out that we closed on Cat we were thrilled um the interesting thing is is earlier on when we were developing the pages prior to even giving it to nikki and megan we had all like the the la team that i work with um we had all thought you know mark ian would be a good eli there was a couple different names again same same sort of thing there was a few names that we put forward to the network that they responded to but in personally in my mind Mark Ian was always, I, you know, I could, you could probably say Kat McNamara was was up there too because I've I've been a fan of hers for a long, long time. But to me, that was like the dream team combo that I never thought we would be able to get them both. You know, when those are like two of the top picks, and then the fact that we did, it was I was over the moon. Like I was for like a week, I was just running around super excited about it. And then once the casting for the other three. Uh, Marisa McIntyre, uh, who plays Sarah, Alex Nunez, who plays Liam, and then Sabrina Soudan, who plays PJ. When we were casting the three of them, um, Marisa I had worked with before, so I was a huge fan of hers, but I had never met Alex and I had never met Sabrina. We just we just fell in love with them. Our director, Jonathan Wright, loved them. You know, Joel, our executive producer, myself, the network executives. It just It just fit. We didn't do any kind of chemistry test with all of them. You know, as these things, there isn't usually time for that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, from day one on set, they just all kind of gelled and became fast friends, which was really nice to see. And honestly, I think it really shows on camera that they have a comfortability and a chemistry with one another. So we got very lucky in that regard. And then you you have two of the like Hallmark A-listers apparently in supporting roles with Benjamin and Nikki. Like, yeah, that's, that's all. I mean, absolutely crazy. Yeah, that they uh, would... Ben. Ben. Ben is one of the most talented, funniest human beings I think oh, yeah, on yeah. the planet. Period. He's we, one of we my favorite. We were fortunate where we got man. to talk to him last year, and the dude oh, is cool. just hilarious. He's just hilarious. He's amazing and insanely smart too. And that's honestly that was Nikki. So we had approached Nikki and said, you know, we think one of the things that would make this even more successful, aside from the wonderful writing and the performances and stuff, and like, look, it's it's going to skew younger, it's going to be hipper and more fun. And, you know, we still want to bring in that Hallmark audience, you know, and Nikki is on, um, is Curious Cater? Right. Is that the name of her? Yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, and aside from that, just being a perennial Hallmark star, we thought as the writer, would you want to play Professor Ambrose, you know, and be kind of like the mentor to these five young law students? And Nikki jumped on the opportunity. And I actually think it was her idea where she was like, and you know who we should get for the district attorney, who's also a recurring character, is Ben, as a favor to me, may consider this. So she reached out to Ben. Ben said, absolutely, I'm there. So, I mean, I, I, I can't, Eric, I can't speak enough about how blessed we feel to have friggin' Nikki Deloach and Ben Ayers, both in recurring roles in this thing. I mean, come on. You know yes. what I mean? It's like we just created, like, the USA, like, the the all-star team for the Olympics in the 90s. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's it's awesome. The thing that's that you just made me think of, and we've talked about this a bunch, is the Hallmark universe is just kind of weird in the way of the, the actors because they are kind of, like, all just friends together. So it does not yeah. surprise me that... Nikki would just be like, oh, let me see if Ben will do as a favor to me. And he'll, without a doubt, you know, doesn't even think, yeah, sure. That sounds fun. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, and I don't think you get that. And you, you obviously deal with a lot of others, but I just don't think you'd get that in the world of, you know, you know, entertainment in general as much. No, there's no family. It goes back to what I was saying about how, you know, that, that brand recognition and it's it, it, it's a world it's a culture but i think honestly the best adjective i can give it is it, it's it's family-like 
You know, when you look at Rama drama, when you look at Christmas Con, you know, the countdown to Christmas and all these events that the actors do, the fact that these guys go, they'll travel from L.A. to New York and they get together. The amount of philanthropic endeavors they have, the charitable things that they do outside of their scope of work. You know, they're, they're amazing brand ambassadors for the network. But to your point, you know, they're all friends. It's a community. You know what I mean? They all know each other, you know, and that's something that you don't see. And I honestly think there's something that transfers on film when you have, I just did a movie with Tyler Hines. I've never seen a human being. I've worked with a lot of famous people. I've never seen somebody who's more appreciative of his fan base than somebody like Tyler, you know, and he's got a massive fan yeah. base, you know? So when you see that, that level of interaction and that level of intimate connection that these guys make, you know, with their, their scores of fans all over the country, when you watch the movie, be with them now you feel like you know them you feel like there's a comfortability there it's like oh i've met that guy or you know i she yeah, she she was at this or you know like she, she responded to me on this when i reached out and tagged her on whatever and it's just it's yeah it's put it this way it's a family that i feel very fortunate to be a part of and get to work with these folks because i can say they are wonderful human beings outside of outside of work but well, yeah that's the thing it's, it's funny because when we started the podcast and it was like I was so intimidated about thinking about reaching out to ask him to be on uh, as a guest on there. And sure. They've all been like so amazingly nice and yeah, sure. I'll be on your podcast. And you know, like we're a little, whatever mystery Hallmark mystery podcast, right? Yeah. Like Ben yeah. Ayers is like, yeah, when you want to do it, I'm, I'm game. I was like, yeah. really? <laughs> like I honestly was surprised and uh, Brennan yeah. Elliott and they, and then they get on and then you talk to them during the interview and they're fantastic, but then you chit chat with them, just chit chat. And like you said, they're just fantastic people. And that's the thing I've just yeah. literally found. And we talked to everyone from costumers through, you know, writers, now a producer, actors. And everyone has just been so generally just nice people, which, you know, Hallmark does not, or excuse me, not Hallmark, Hollywood does not necessarily have a, a reputation for genuine nice people, right? You always think of like the slimy or whatever and stuff. But yeah. like I say, the Hallmark world is a little different in that aspect. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to um, to here. So, one of the things that we have, um, we you know, we talked about, and you talked about like the story arc is a little bit different. Is a lot of Hallmark fans are just really upset that mysteries are being made one offs, and then they're not being made like they were before. You know, seven episodes of Mystery One Hundred One, five episodes right. of Gourmet Detective, five episodes of Crossword Mysteries. Now they just seem to be doing a lot of these one-offs and people are getting frustrated that they're not getting extra. Curious Cater is one where we've been fortunate, where, we've, where we have mm -hmm. had them. So what, what do you tell people to get them excited about this one, yet another new mystery? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incumbent on the viewership, right? Like if you want to see more, you got to tune in and watch it. If the numbers are good, the network sees that it did well, they will make more installments. You know what I mean? I think that's not to say that some of the ones... Look, there's a lot of factors, a lot of contributing factors that come into play right. with respect to deciding what moves forward and what doesn't, you know. I think in the heyday, you had your Aurora Tea Gardens, although we're making more of those. I mean, it's our right. company that makes the the Redux, the new ones. And I think, of, you know, the, the first one was fantastic. Wait, did you say your um, company does that? But, you know, yeah, Muse Entertainment. Oh, we're the ones Skyler that Skyler loved the, uh... Skyler with uh, mm -hmm. the Yeah, she's, the she was amazing. One. Yep. I, and I'm Evan not a big Roderick, they were they were just yeah. phenomenal. I'm not an Aurora Tea Garden fan until that one. And then I'm like, I'm all in now on the new one. So all right. Sorry. Keep you'd going. be surprised how many people like no, 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 you'd be surprised how many people I've heard that where they were that was a tricky one, you know what I mean? And the the executive, again, my boss, Joel, as well as um another development exec who I work with, Scott Clayton, they were really the two that championed that the reimagining of that franchise. And I don't think they could have done a better job. You know, the director, Jessica Harmon, was phenomenal. The performances that's that Skyler and Evan gave were phenomenal. The supporting cast was great. Not an easy thing to take a franchise that did what, 17 movies? you know, right. reboot it as a prequel or an origin story, maintain the integrity of the franchise that did so well, but at the same time, give it a fresh spin. And I just think that they knocked it out of the park. And I can tell you that the next two are going to be e even better than the first one. But They're they very didn't, clever. They, they, they didn't get, you know, whatever Nikki to be a supporting actor for uh, for that one. So kudos That's, to you. This guys. is true. Uh, yeah, thank right. you. Again, that's that was easy when she's the one writing it and we can ask her. You know? uh, we'll, we'll throw Ben in there. All right, so back to the yeah. how well, they did get Mary Lou Henner, but 
All right. So back to how we're going to get people excited over a new, a new mystery. Yeah, honestly, like I said, like uh, to get them excited, I would say that this one, what I'm most proud of is this one has something for everyone. There's a part of me that, you know, if you, if you tune into HMM and you love Hallmark mysteries, you will love this movie. This is, this is a, a little bit more elevated than your standard, you know, three red herring twist and it's number two who ends up being the call. You know what I mean? Like this is, it's different. Like I said, it's, it's, it's like an episode. It feels very procedural. Um, like what you would see, like a broadcast show or something on like primetime, you know, like it's, it's a law and order meets a 21 jump street, you know? So that's why I say it's got something for everybody. It'll have the familiarity that you've come to know and love, but it's also going to be something different. I mean, this one, we were working on developing the second one just before the break. And, uh, you know, if we're, if we're fortunate enough to be able to, to do a second one, we were kicking around ideas. And I was just so impressed with, you know, Nikki and Megan, the writers, as well as, you know, our, our team of creatives, how we just kept saying, it's not enough. We got to challenge it. We got to go further. We got to, it was like a, like a writing room where everybody was on the same pages. You know, how can we make this even better? How can we do something that nobody's seen before? And that's what I think in a nutshell, this franchise will bring, you know, if you want to see something where you walk away going, man, I've never seen anything like that on Hallmark before. This is the one. All right. Well, like I say, Countdown to Christmas gave us a lot of that. So maybe the 2024 yeah. mysteries will uh, will continue that. Oh, I think so. Street gun. I think so. so. We're gonna we're gonna kick it off with a bang. This is this is uh, this is a good one. That I've right. I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> so so you just alluded to it. One of the things that is sort of our little soapbox that we get on is with mysteries. We think, and I understand there's this is me talking as the fan, right? And we, you know, we mentioned mm -hmm. before, there's a lot of the stuff that goes on be behind the scenes that we just don't as fans uh, know or understand. But as fans, we just think like, I think Hallmark needs to commit to doing three episodes. When they, when we launch a mystery, we're going to do three episodes because one of the differences between uh, rom-com and the mystery, and you, you, you said it before, is the rom-com is all neatly packaged in that 84 minutes done. Whereas mysteries... The characters develop, there's arcs to them, the romance, yeah. you know, if there's romance, it doesn't happen in that first episode necessarily. You no. get a lot of more tension. Yeah. And, you know, Curious Cater, we're talking about that. That's a great example where like the first one was good, but the second one was so much better because these characters now we knew who they were and then they took them to the next level. Right. And yep. so that's, I guess, the frustration of when you do get these one off mysteries. And there have been some great ones Nikki and Nora, Cases of Mystery Lane, Francesca mm -hmm. Quinn, like that have so much more story to tell. And I hope, by the way, this does not end on a cliffhanger if you don't have green lit for episode two. But, you know, so back to the thing is I understand there's the economics and there, there's the business decisions, but don't you think it'd be a better world if they would just commit to three? Paycheck aside for you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, as, as the producer is making them, you know, and the ones that are creating them, then of course, that would be wonderful. I think there's a lot of other factors that come into play, it, uh, like all the ones that you mentioned, the Nikki and Nora, and, you know, the, uh, those aren't our, ours, but I can say, and I'm pretty confident in saying this, nobody go, whether it's a licensed movie that's, you know, IP or, you know, different source material that it gets brought into Hallmark and, and Hallmark greenlights it, and puts it in development or whether it's you know an in-house endeavor that they then outsource to somebody else to make for them as an in-house franchise i don't think the intention is ever just to do one i mean you said it yourself those those serialized elements those character driven elements right where you watch those relationships where the people come closer and it's like the will they won't they you know maybe there's a a looming threat or like a big bad that carries over into multiple movies i mean that's the connective tissue that makes us come back for these things not 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 the mystery that's central to that movie of course that's important but it's watching these characters grow and evolve so nobody makes a mystery with the intention of only making one so i will say that you know what i mean now as far as why don't they just greenlight you can't greenlight three if one doesn't do well and like i said i don't even know if that's the reason why some of those other ones didn't get a second one there's there's so many factors right. you know there's scheduling there's money, there's, there's a million other things that, you know, we've already got this many for this year in our slate, you know, we couldn't find an error date to put this one, you know, like, I, I don't want to speak for the network, because I truthfully, I don't know all the ins and outs, you know, behind their doors as to what their decision making is. But 
so I can just say that, yeah, as a producer, I would love it. if <laughs> That became a reality where it's like, here's a three picture deal. I wish that was the case for everything. You know what I mean? But right, right. it's uh, sadly not, not the case. When you, when you do talk to him, did you like talk about the beyond an episode or is the conversation really just this singular installment or is it like, Oh, Hey, this is what the first one is, but this is where it can lead. Is that like yeah. even part of the discussion? Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. These things, these things tend to be more of like a hybrid. It's almost like a TV series when you sell them. I mean, part of the selling feature is saying, here's where Kat M McNamara and, you know, Marky and here's where their characters are going to go by movie two. We hope if we get to make a second one, we will see their characters come this much closer. Then by movie three, they'll separate. And then by movie four, one of them gets the offer to move away, but then ends up coming back. And then by movie five, like we will map out in a Bible pretty much what happens, okay. you know, because that that's what they want to see. You know, that's that's the selling feature. OK, perfect. So they want they want to know that has the legs. They just may not oh, want yeah. to do the legs. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I mean, again, it, right. and it's completely, it's deter dependent on, you know, how well the movie does is one of the major things, you know, so. Well, so here's the thing. You just convinced us by telling us how this is the most unique mystery ever, and it's going to be this wonderful, mm -hmm. great thing. So there's no, and you've got, yeah, that was. I mean, you've got Nikki writing it, who she pretty much owns Hallmark, right? So whatever she says goes. Yeah. So we can assume you have three more episodes coming down. So all I want to say is when you're thinking about casting a dead body, Right here, this guy. That's my goal. <laughs> I want to be a. You got it, man. I want to. I want to be it. a dead body on a hallmark in a mystery at some point. All right. So, all right. So, can you tell us any fun behind the scenes story, whether it be you know from that something's going on set or just as far as the making of it or anything like that? You got any good fun story yeah. from this one? Yeah. The um. So you'll you'll see when the movie comes out on the twelfth. There's uh, a couple scenes that take place in a marina. Um, around a giant yacht and um, where we see Kat and Marky and um, Casey and Eli are two leads uh, chasing down who they think is responsible for a murder. That day that we were filming, I think it was over the span of two days at this marina, it was like torrential rain. There was a tornado warning. We were running inside and then running out to film a couple lines and we go back in and we just, we lost so much time that day. It was like, it was almost one of those those days where you got to throw your hands up in the air and just say, well, it's going to be what it's going to be. You know, like we're going to have to pivot the scenes inside. But the reason I bring this up is because some cat who, you know, this is this is a major star. This is somebody who has over a million followers on social, has been on big time TV shows, you know, but you never know what talking to her. She's just so down to earth and real because the scene with her and Marky and it's this two-hander that's probably a page in a bit, you know, where they just in, were in and out. We were like, because of the rain, we got to shoot it in one shot, just a tight two shot. You know, we just need to friggin' one minute of no rain kind of thing. And then we can get it and we can move on. The problem is, is every time we'd run back outside to get set up and shoot it, the car that they're standing in front of would be covered in rain, but the sun would be out. And in the movie, it's supposed to be a sunny day. So we've got crew guys wiping down the car. Kat grabs a roll of paper towel and she's like, everybody, get your asses over here. Get in here. And here you've got your star literally with like brawn paper towels, two handing <laughs> it like the karate kid doing the wax on, wax off thing, hollering at people to get in, wiping the car down like it's a NASCAR pit crew. And then she take the paper towels, throw them away and go like this and be like, okay, let's just shoot. And then we'd shoot the scene and we actually got it. And the only reason we got it is because, you know, when it, positivity and energy like that, it, it's a top down thing. You know what I mean? So when my crew watches the star of a franchise, grab the paper towel and do that and be like, come on, guys, more, you know, many hands make light work kind of thing. Everybody rushes in and does it. And we were able, the only reason we were able to get that scene is because of what she did in that moment. And that's like one example of how, lucky we were with this cast you know the five of them were just amazing like that there was never that, that could have been a recipe for a disaster if not cast right as far as egos and whatever and there was none of that you know what i mean it was just it was constant laughs every day on that one that is awesome actually if i ever run mm -hmm. into i have to ever uh, wax wax my car for me then sounds like she's got yeah. the skills <laughs> yeah you could tell she's definitely uh yeah there was some uh that wasn't her first time that's for sure 
I, so you, you kind of alluded to this earlier is when you, you're developing a mystery, it's a little different than the, than the, the rom-com. How do you balance the suspense with the storytelling, you know, to keep the audience engaged? Because like you're saying, you can't cut out something, but it's, yeah. it's, it is a weird balance that, that that's much harder, I assume. It, it is. It is. It's, it's one that I enjoy. Um, it starts in the development process. It, sometimes it's easier when you're working with like a tighter, shorter document that's like a 10 page document in the outline to realize, OK, we got to we got to work out this mystery. It's falling a little flat here. You know, we got a lot of character stuff. We got a lot of good emotional beats here, but we need to beef up how challenging it is for our leads to figure out to get on the right trail of who the bad guy is kind of thing. Um, so a lot of times it's in that outline. A lot of times once the movie is um, expanded into draft and we read the script, we'll see where that how that balance lies um, when you've got got, you know, a 103 page script versus a 10 page, you know, treatment or outline. Um, and then honestly, a lot of it is in the edit room. Because when you're shooting, it's difficult to know, you know, you, you basically you want to shoot everything and get as much as you can, because the worst case scenario would be to get into the edit room and not have what you need, right. And then in the edit, it's playing around, especially in that first act, you know, that first act that's 18 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, that's what's going to hook your audience. They're going to change the channel. If you don't explain the world, explain the characters, explain the mystery and, you know, set up some level of intrigue to come back after that first commercial break. So in the edit, in that first act, it's, it's all about finding that balance and doing that delicate dance of have we given them enough mystery? Have we set up enough intrigue? Have we set up enough peril? Does it feel like the stakes are high enough? Because sometimes, you know, it can fall a little flat. And then also, have we have we made it entertaining, you know? And, and is this something that, you know, they, we are now emotionally invested in those characters to want to come back after that first commercial break. So, you know, those are the, those are the three during development um, and then when you're shooting and then in the edit. So it's, it's, I guess you could say it's a constant thing all the way through the, with the mysteries. It's, it's a conversation. Yeah. About balance the whole way through. That's interesting though. You said, like you said, that first 18 minutes really is key because I, can, I can't tell you how many people have left me comments when I've talked about a movie being, you know, Oh, I really like this movie or whatever. And like, Oh, I turned it off like 10 minutes in. I'm like, how do yeah. you turn it off 10 minutes in? Because there's so much to come and they missed like where the movie really got great. But I guess that's the, that's the key, right? You got to get that hook. Mm -hmm. uh, you got 18 minutes to, to, to engage them. Yeah. All right. And that's where, if you're lucky enough, if you're lucky enough to work with executives over at Hallmark that, and I mean, all, all of them are like this, that they just know, you know what I mean? Like we, the executive who's in charge of true justice, uh, the two of them, you know, one of the things that they said to us right off the, the bat was, you know, you need a scene to open this movie that tells us who these these law students are. We want to see them interacting because we're starting with too much action, too much mystery. We're not seeing the character building. So and they were 100 percent right. And then once we once Nikki and Megan rewrote that scene, that's beautiful. And you see the camaraderie and the friendship that these kids have with one another, these law students have with one another. Well, now, as soon as we introduce the mystery and the challenge for them, we as the viewership are immediately on board emotionally and we're rooting for them. Whereas before, as much, and we didn't even notice that until our execs at Hallmark said, you know, you need this in order to have that happen. So yeah, it's 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 a collaborative effort, but it's it, there's always a conversation of balance. And, you know, as you say, if you don't have that in that first act, man, they change the channel and then you're doomed. That's it. And then we're not getting episode two, three, and then me as the dead body. There you go. All right. There you go. Yeah. Everyone, Can please we want watch. Please watch. Hashtag Eric. <laughs> All right. Eric. That's what, that's what we need. All right. So last question. So last year, I think, was a year where it was like even more than the actors. We had Nicole McCormick with her costuming and the cases of Mr. Lane, where she just developed both Birdie and Alden so great with their costuming. William McKnight and the cinematography of Aura Tea Garden, something new, which he said is one of your guys' movies. So you knew like that movie, the cinematography of it just was so cool. Mm -hmm. You know, the, Jennifer mm -hmm. Stroud, you had her in your, um, just she she's doing this movie I saw for your costuming. She did. Yeah, yeah, she was Catch our wardrobe. Claus, movie. And the Catch Me, like the costuming and Catch Me Your Claws was so great. So is there something like, above and beyond just like the story and the acting about this movie that really is going to set it apart as well like you know like i said there's the costume the cinematography or the music or anything yeah like all, all of the above i love the that's the a, that's composer. a cop out you gotta give a you gotta give a real 
you got to pick one. Uh, I'll give you two, two specific, two specific okay. things then. The production design, the production design, which was done by a gentleman by the name of Shane Boucher, um, who actually runs the services team in Ottawa that we work with. He's one of the most talented production designers I've ever worked with. Um, the juxtaposition that he came up with as far as the, the traditional gothic looking architecture when they're in law school or they're in a courthouse versus the new age modern kind of feel that feels like an episode of csi miami you know what i mean with the the, the lighting design with the blue lights and like you're in the lab and you're using all the high-tech stuff the the juxtaposition there between ultra modern and cool and flashy versus like that like i said the, that traditional kind of you know uh, law schooly look i i think he knocked it out of the park and i think that this one from a production value standpoint is just visually so much prettier and the second thing I will say is also under the umbrella of visual, which was our, our DP, our cinematographer, Michael Galbraith, who works very closely with our director, uh, Jonathan Wright, who's unreal. I, I could go on all day about how good and talented Jonathan is. But um, Michael, the DP, he was also the one who did family history um, with Niall and Janelle. He's got a very cinematic look. It's always a little bit darker. It's always a little bit moodier. You know, like I said, this looks like an episode of Law and Order. I remember watching the cold open of this one where we're using drone shots. We have a police car chase and there's all kinds of things happening that you don't typically see in a movie of this size or scope, you know, within the first five minutes. And he says, like, you know, you get excited when you say like it's uh, this feels different. This, this, this doesn't feel like a traditional kind of, you know, TV movie kind of thing. This one, I honestly can say it doesn't feel like it. It feels totally different, you know? Um, so those are the two things that I would point out aside from the amazing direction, storytelling and performance. I, I right. know I may be overselling the, the production design and the cinematography are pretty badass. All right. That's, that's, that's very cool. I'll say, so your family history mystery, um, Sydney, my co-host, the turquoise phone that Janelle Parrish had in that may yeah. have been her favorite thing of the entire 2023 <laughs> uh, mystery season. Oh, she cool. would always talk yeah. about her her phone, and she's like, "I don't even have like a you know landline, but I want that turquoise phone." So <laughs> I know it's not the first time I've heard that actually. So, all right, Mike. Well, this was absolutely fascinating. Like I say, you really opened up the eyes on a whole different side that we, you know, as, as fans, we don't know, necessarily always see from the background of what, what takes place in making a movie. And it's just absolutely fascinating. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you agreeing uh, to, to join me. Um, we're looking forward to being the first mystery of the year. That's two years in a row. You get to kick off the, uh, the mystery yeah. season. So congratulations on that. That's right. Yeah. Family history last year was, was January, yeah. I think so, right? uh, January um, 8th. And now we're January 12th this year. So yeah, I, I really appreciate you having me on. I hope everybody tunes in. It's like I said, this is this one's got something for everyone. I'm really, really proud of this one. And it's a super exciting, hopefully, uh, a franchise that, that will last for a long time. Well, like I said, yeah, we said before, the, the, the cast is just completely next level. So if all the other things are as good mm -hmm. as you say, I don't see how it cannot be home run. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. All right, Eric. Let's talk to you later. Okay. Thanks very much, man. Bye. Take it easy.